Welcome back to the Seek Strength YouTube. Uh, today we're going to take a little look at sleep's effect on high intensity rugby sevens training. Today's paper is titled Sleep Quality and Quantity of International Rugby Sevens Players During Pre-Season. And this is coming at us from the Institute for Sport, Physical Activity and Leisure, Leeds, Beckett University, Leeds, United Kingdom, and also the Research Department for the French Rugby Federation, which is pretty cool. So in today's paper, the researchers wanted to look at the effect of pre-season training on rugby players' sleep and did it alter it positively or negatively. So what we had was nine rugby sevens players. These were at least one year on international rugby scene. So we had high quality athletes, which is always great to have. Uh, the study actually originally started with 14 players, but due to a series of events and things that would have been possibly influenced the outcome, uh, several of these were, were removed and we were left with nine rugby players. Basically what we had was a pretty simple analysis done this wasn't any interventionist work so the methods are pretty short essentially what we had was they carried out their normal routine which we have a pretty detailed uh, infographic of which is very very interesting to see rugby players completed their two to four training sessions per day which included their rugby sessions or their training sessions or their snc sessions or whatever it was involved and then they're simply their sleep was recorded before they went to bed this clicked sleep time essentially on the sleep recording device and then when they woke up in the morning they ended the sleep sleeping session according to the voice and then other extraneous factors were measured during the training rp was recorded or session relative rp was as they were using in this which is a little bit different rp they also recorded the total running distance and the speed they were running at to get several extraneous factors and metrics on to fitzy for the analysis of these very important metrics so on to the results section next the interesting thing about this result section is that they looked at the the stats so like how long they slept for how long it took for them to fall asleep the amount of time they were in bed, the amount of time it took them to wake up and then get out of bed. Then they had subjective quality of sleep markers. So that was like how well you felt you slept. The interesting thing though is that they looked at this in the weeks where they said they're their highest RP. So when they had like the highest rate of perceived exertion, then they looked at it in weeks when the actual like total distance covered was highest. They looked at it in weeks when acceleration and deceleration was highest. So um, for those of you who don't know, acceleration and deceleration is commonly kept as a marker in contact sports or field sports. So basically, the amount of force that's put through your joints, a lot of the time the, the total distance doesn't really matter. If I have a huge amount of really fast acceleration bouts and a lot of very, very fast stops, that could be due to sprinting, stopping and sprinting in an alternate alternative direction like agility drills, but it could also be due to large high contact zones so like a lot of tackles will rate very highly on a deceleration test then they looked at things like high speed distance so over the course of a week only only the distance that went over a certain amount of meters per second on their accelerometers only that was tracked and they looked at is there a difference between sleep quality in the the high speed distance week or like the the week where that is highest versus the total distance covered week so to further weigh in on our hatred of rp and and I think it's now become like a piece of Sikistan propaganda that RP is absolute bollocks for most of the time. What we see is there's there's more values coming out of the, the total distance covered weeks, the high speed distance weeks. And so what we see is there's there's more data coming out of the, the actual proper quantitative methods um, weeks. So when the actual training volume is highest, we tend to see better data or more significant data coming out versus when the rate of perceived exertion is highest. Okay, sleep onset time is something that decreases over almost all of these markers though. So whether you're looking at total distance covered being highest or rate of perceived exertion being highest or acceleration, deceleration being high, whatever it is, across all of those groups, sleep onset time decreases. So what you're probably seeing there is a mixture of these players being in camp so they're away from home they have a certain amount of of acclimatization if you want to call it that or just getting used to a certain environment they're also getting used to a certain schedule so as all of us will know uh, sleep is very habitual like you'll tend to have certain habits that form around sleep so it's very likely this kind of decreasing in the onset time for sleep is actually due to to some sort of kind of human factors versus the actual training load it could of course you do be due to the fact that training is getting tougher and that they're falling asleep easier because they're more tired 
Um, we're just not quite sure from this. I spoke earlier about the group with RP not having quite as much data as the total distance covered week and the high speed distance covered week. This is a classic case in the case of subjective sleep quality. So what they had was they had a, an electronic diary. They recorded the quality of their sleep, like how well they felt they slept, how fatigued they felt in the morning. And then for the, the RP, they just had a, a diary or a questionnaire that they'd simply fill in. So what we see is subjective sleep quality having a likely moderate decrease over the course of the training cycle. So in the the weeks of total distance covered and the total high distance high speed distance being covered, that subjective sleep quality is at its lowest point. So it's significantly lower than the the initial weeks of the study when it wasn't as high. And that's one of the more interesting findings that people are actually feeling like they're sleeping worse during those weeks. Okay, one marker that did have commonalities between like uh, the RPE being highest and the total distance covered being highest is total sleep time. So total sleep time decreased over the, uh, like from beginning to the highest point. So basically what you're finding is players, not only are they feeling like they slept worse or they're feeling like the quality was poorer, but also the total time they were asleep for was lower. There are other markers then like the get up time. So that's the time between them waking up in the morning and actually getting out of bed and a couple of other markers. These probably aren't as important to talk about though as the ones we just mentioned. So obviously the interesting thing about this as the training load increased and the training got harder essentially, the participant's sleep got worse. Now maybe with nine participants, you might say that might not happen for everyone, but it's interesting that's consistent across those nine players. Uh, the ironic thing about that, I suppose, is that as we train harder, is we essentially end up needing more sleep. And so the less sleep you get, the less harder you can train. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. And it's an unfortunate cycle if you're trying to train harder. There's obviously a couple of things you can mitigate, you can do to mitigate that. But again, it's uh, it's an interesting kind of paradigm. One of the interesting things about overtraining, for example, if anyone's ever experienced overtraining syndrome or you read up on it, a couple of symptoms will be erratic sleep difficulty getting to sleep waking up at a random time during the night fully awake so sometimes people report waking up in the middle of the night essentially white knuckling their sheets or clenching racing heart rate cold or hot sweats cold or hot sweats yeah that makes sense so people will be overtrained and will massively affect your sleep and obviously one of the best ways to get out of overtraining is getting more quality sleep but again if you're overtrained you need that sleep so very very interesting uh dynamics going on with sleep and training as a whole and it's probably one of the most important things uh, even before nutrition essentially because we've seen a couple of studies where calorie matched people with less sleep or both were looking to reduce calories but the group with less quality and less sleep i believe ended up losing more muscle mass than opposed to fat free mass compared to the group got more sleep so obviously better quality sleep will influence your decision making during training your motivation your metabolism uh, your desire to train so even if you are still able to uh, perform to a certain extent regardless of how so much sleep you got your pre-routine desire or pre-session desire might be massively influenced by your decision by how much sleep you got the night before so even you may not even have trained in a day where you might have been totally fine had you otherwise gotten better quality sleep so sleep is hugely important for training it's probably one of the most important things there's often things we try to get people to look at first because without good quality sleep you are essentially i think i said everything putting over it stepping over nickels to pick up a dollar i hope a nickel is a smaller one i don't uh, i don't know u.s american freedom units but i assume it's one of those so basically it's uh you're basically shooting yourself in the face or the foot or the elbow whenever the saying goes if you don't get good quality sleep first before you go and get the all the other things sorted out first so sleep is number one and then you start out everything after and matthew walker probably the most famous person or the most uh He's the social media sleep person, I suppose, that most people will be aware of. Uh, a very good book, Why We Sleep, on Joe Rogan. He was recently involved in, well, in the last few years, involved with a study with NFL players in relation to how much sleep they got was correlated with how likely or unlikely they were to get injured. So the less sleep they got, the more injuries they received over the course of a season. So very, very interesting. Could be for a couple of reasons. For example, the inadequate recovery of tissues or ligaments poor decision making uh, inability to recover from previous sessions so you're essentially not recovering those particular ligaments or soft tissue injuries uh, just maybe bad decisions during the course of a training session so a lot of things can be influenced by that sleep and so sleep is one of the best things you can take off your training to make sure you have the best quality training so just to kind of play devil's advocate here for a sec when we look at the study and when we look at what they found they find basically that 
like when players are training very very hard that their quality of sleep or the amount of time they're sleeping for decreases the one thing when you look at the training cycle is the harder sessions are tending to come towards the end so the weeks where the total distance covered was highest and the kind of high speed distance was highest were all towards the end of the training block so because we don't know what the players are coming in after doing so it's very likely that these players are coming from a a club career or, or some other form of training previously could just be that in the first couple of weeks they are very tired from additional physical loading they might be recovering from that season or from the end of the season then when they come into this particular training camp they mightn't be uh, overtrained but they could just be tired so it could be a fact that they needed extra sleep to recover from extraneous loading here there's another thing that happens when you look at sleep studies so the classic sleep study is you get 50 students, you put them in a dungeon or you put them in some sort of darkened area and they're allowed to sleep as much as they want. What you tend to see is like in sleep deprived populations that it's usually between 10 and 14 days that it takes for them to stop kind of sleeping 14, 16, 18 hours per day. Most of the time when that does level off, they get between 8 and 10 hours a day. So is it a fact here that something in their environment has changed? It is likely, right? They're, they're with different coaches. They're with a different team. They might just have been catching up on previously lower levels of sleep. So we don't know that. Uh, but it's very, very interesting that in the higher intensity weeks, their levels and their quality of sleep drop down. So probably the most important thing for you to note when you're watching this is what are you going to do with your training? So all of us should know when kind of heavier weeks are coming up or heavier periods in training are coming up. So what can you do to kind of combat this decrement in sleep that could come along with that? Well, the first thing you'd look at doing is timing your training cycle as well. So when other stresses are, are at their lowest, your training stress might be at its highest. So if you're an athlete now who might be in, in university or you might be in school and you're studying at the same time you're training, you need to be very, very conscious that the, the silo that will affect your sleep from training is fed by the same stuff that will affect your sleep from studying, right? So a lot of us will, will kind of commonly think that, okay, my exams are coming up, my sleep might be sacrificed, or I have an area of high stress coming up or a time of high stress, my sleep is going to be sacrificed. It's the exact same with your training. So what you can do is make sure, as I said, your training cycle is correctly planned so you're not training really hard when you're going to be studying really hard or working really hard. You can also do things like, augment different areas of your training so say if you're a weightlifter and you're really working on your snatch and clean and jerk just make sure you can be really working on your snatch and clean and jerk while not working so much on your strength work or trying to lose weight or trying to alter body composition or trying to do a host of other things at the same time so that's important make sure we're we're conscious of when stress will be occurring and then we're not loading all our stress into the same bucket and that bucket is a, a time frame. The second thing you can do then is look at things that improve the quality of your sleep, right? So for, for some of us, that might be going for a cold shower before you go to sleep. For more of us, that will be the, the sleep hygiene within the room. These are common things you'll all have heard of, like dark room, cool temperature, making sure you're comfortable in bed, making sure blue light or or light sources aren't getting at your eyes making sure you're not getting overly stimulated before bed so like things that will tend to trigger people are if you're working and you check your emails before you go to sleep that will tend to set off a, a chain reaction which is just going to keep you awake for longer and when you do fall asleep the quality of your sleep could then be worse other things that really affect your sleep things like nicotine any form of stimulant so like we all know that the, the half-life of caffeine is so long but if you're training in the evening and even if you're training at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. and you're taking some sort of pre-workout, even if that pre-workout isn't jacked up or loaded with caffeine, there are other stimulants in that that really affect your training. The last thing I'd say then is the actual training itself is probably more of a stimulus than anything else we do. So aside from all other stimulants we might take, aside from all other forms of stress, the actual physical exercise is a form of stress itself. So racking up our, or jacking up our cortisol levels immediately prior to going to sleep isn't ideal. If you do have control over things like this, training a small bit earlier in the evening or even pushing some of your session to maybe before work or at lunchtime 
and then having a small bit more training to do after is very, very beneficial, particularly if your training load is very high. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you're just getting back into the gym and you're a weightlifter, go and check out our new program. It's only up like a week. It's called Getting Back to Weightlifting, or it'll be a link in the bio. If you want more programming, more consultancy, more advice in your training, go and check out the website. And yeah, if you could throw your comments about your sleep in the comment box down below, even a comment for the algorithm, it would be greatly appreciated by Seekistan. Thank you. Oh,